Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I have another archeology span themed video for you today. In case you haven't already picked up on this, as an archeologist, I quite enjoy watching a lot of archeology span themed pop culture on television and movies. And recently I just finished Marvel's Moon Knight series, which is, you can find on Disney+. Plus. Even if you've only seen the trailer, you can probably surmise that this series draws very heavily on ancient Egyptian mythology, art, and culture. And I thought it would be interesting today, as somebody who is an archaeologist with an interest in Egyptology particularly, I studied a lot about ancient Egypt in my undergrad, I thought that I would go through the series for you today and do a bit of an archaeological review on the tidbits of ancient Egypt that we see scattered throughout the series. I will begin by saying that I am aware that neither this series or the comics are striving to be particularly historically accurate here and are using quite a heavy dose of artistic license on certain parts of the series in order to tell their story. That is perfectly within their remit as makers of art. And to be honest, I actually really enjoyed watching this series and I thought that they did a really good job of portraying ancient Egyptian culture in it. But there definitely are parts where there are big gaps between fact and fiction, which is what we're going to cover today. Spoiler alert, I will be discussing the entire series in this video, so if you want to avoid spoiling anything before you watch it, go watch the series and then come back and watch this. I'm not going to cover it on an episode by episode basis, like I said, I'm doing the whole series, and I'm just going to be talking about the things that I noticed, and obviously there might be some things that I missed. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe my channel to see more videos from me, and also if you have time and you can go and give me a follow on Instagram at rachelalmond.digs, I would really appreciate that. Okay guys, let's dig in. I'm going to start with my biggest beef with the whole series, which is also kind of like the first first big exposure that we have to ancient Egypt in the series which comes in at episode 3 which is when Steve slash Mark visits the Great Pyramid of Giza for a meeting of the gods. I gotta start off by saying this great chamber, while very cool and looking absolutely fantastic and, and on point with ancient Egyptian architecture, in no way exists in the Great Pyramid of Giza. If there was a void that big in the Great Pyramid, we would have found it by now. Not to mention the fact that when you pan up to the ceiling, you can see what looks like a bit of like a skylight at the top that definitely doesn't exist. Interestingly, a team of archaeologists actually did recently discover using various technological archaeological methods, a large void or empty space within the Great Pyramid recently that they've not been able to thoroughly investigate yet, but it is not nearly the size and shape or anything or even remotely similar to what they're using to portray in the series. So that might be something that they partly took inspiration from. This room is also where we encounter the other avatars of the Egyptian gods. And one thing every Egyptologist and archaeologist or Egyptian enthusiast will notice watching this is that there's really not a lot of them. The pantheon of the Egyptian gods is huge! And it also varies in terms of who's kind of the most important god or goddess, and there's lots of interconnected relationships between all of them as they go on throughout the multi-thousand year history of ancient Egypt. The ones that we see portrayed here are Hathor, Isis, Osiris, Horus, and Tefnut. I particularly liked how they did the pronunciation of Hathor and Isis, because I don't know about you, but for the majority of my life, I pronounced that as Hathor and Isis. And I think they might have changed Isis because of the similarity to a certain terrorist group. But aside from that, Hathor and how that's pronounced, I really picked up on because one of the first things that I learned as an undergraduate in one of my archaeology classes was that instead of pronouncing it Hathor, as I had done my entire life, it is pronounced Hathor because ancient Egyptians don't have the th sound in their language, or at least I was told that they did not. You should also note that a lot of the names that we use for Egyptian gods nowadays are actually Greek versions of their names, and they're not often very similar to what ancient Egyptians actually would have called these gods, or anything that we really relate to with ancient Egypt. For example, Egypt itself is a Greek name. The actual Egyptians would have called it their land Kemet, which means the black land, which refers to the flooding of the banks of the Nile that happens every year. That's a really long way of saying that I appreciated that it seemed like they were trying to adhere to perhaps slightly more 
authentic pronunciations of names, although they obviously use the Greekified versions of Osiris, Horus. We'll move on now to some of the other characters in the series, and we're first going to talk about Amet, who is kind of like the main villain slash she is the person whom the main actual villain of the story is performing all of his dastardly deeds in the name of during the series. She was a goddess, but she was also kind of like their equivalent to the boogeyman and was not necessarily someone you wanted to come across. At the end of their journey into the afterlife and before they were admitted into the ancient Egyptian equivalent of heaven, the heart, your heart would be weighed against the feather of ma'at or truth. And if you were found wanting, your heart and subsequently your soul would be devoured by Amit. The actual judgment itself was made by scales, but the person overseeing this entire process was not Amit. It was a god by the name of Anubis, as we know him, also, uh, I think a more accurate way of saying his name would be Inpu, and he is generally who is considered to be the god of the dead. So Amit has gotten quite a significant <laughs> upgrade in this series from her previous role. Also, when we finally see the personification of her in the final episode, she is depicted as someone with a crocodile head and a human's roughly upward walking body. I think she has clawed hands, but she's wearing a dress, she's walking as if she's bipedal. Any depictions that we see of Amit in ancient Egyptian art shows her more in the position of like a sitting dog. She is meant to have the head of a crocodile, the fore body of a lion, and then the rear body of a hippopotamus, which are three of the most dangerous animals in ancient Egyptian times. I will say though that they did get her hair like with the kind of like dreadlocks that she has as correct because she is shown to have a hairstyle similar to that in the artwork. The other big mythological figure that is largely present in this series is the god Khonshu, which I'm not sure is the correct pronunciation of his name in ancient Egyptian. I think it's more like to be Khonsu, but there's several different ways that you could say it. He is often depicted as a human mummy, uh, so he's like wrapped up and then his face is shown and his skin is green, and sometimes he is shown to have either an eagle or a falcon's head. So based on this, how he is shown in the show is obviously quite a deviation from how he would have been seen by ancient Egyptians. There are parts of it that are correct in that he holds a staff and he does have the wrappings of a mummy, but to be shown with the skull of a animal is not accurate at all. Not to mention that that skull that they show it does not in any way resemble a eagle or falcon skull. It's got like this really long pointy nose. To be honest, it reminded me more of like a plague mask. When you see him in the literature, his staff itself doesn't have a crescent moon on it. It's actually usually on his head where he'll have a crescent that is then supporting basically what is a moon disc on top of his head. <laughs> He is the god of the moon, so Moon Knight makes sense. His name actually is supposed to mean traveler, and he was seen as a protector god of travelers of the night, and he was also associated with healing and the measurement of time. So all of these things are things that we see reflected in the show, which I think is, a, is great. During the early part of Egyptian history, Khonsu was considered to be a much more dark and violent god than what he's seen in the latter part of history. So this is definitely, I think, where they drew a large part of inspiration for their portrayal of Khonsu in the series. As you can see, a lot of his things that he's associated with is reflected in the show, but not necessarily in the same way that it actually was in real life. Probably one of the biggest doses of Egyptology that we have in the show is in the fourth episode known as The Tomb. The main antagonist of the story finds the thing that he's looking for, which is the Tomb of Amit, so that he can release her to judge. And the episode accordingly starts off with Layla and Steve slash Mark looking for where Harrow and his followers have been digging for the tomb. Now, the first thing that struck me about this episode when they were when I was watching it was that having been to Egypt, <laughs> there is nothing remotely close <laughs> to that kind of a landscape anywhere near Cairo. And at the same time, I was looking at it, I was like, that landscape looks 
really familiar. So I did a little bit of Googling and I actually found out that these scenes set in the desert are actually filmed in Jordan, even though they are set in Egypt in the show. And the location that they're filmed in Jordan is the Wadi Rum Nature Preserve, which I have been to several times. Once Layla and Steve go inside the tomb, they encounter a room where they have a bunch of talk about the Eye of Horus, also known as the Wadjet which is a very famous symbol from ancient Egypt that I think many people would recognize on site. And Steve does a bit of exposition about the eye, all of which I fact checked and is almost entirely true. So the eye of Horus uh, comes from an ancient Egyptian myth where the god Horus fought the god Seth and it, during said fight, the, his I got ripped out. <laughs> it was later replaced by the god that we call Thoth, whose name was actually more like Juti, I think that's the right name, way of saying it, but not sure. And so this eye became a really powerful symbol for Egyptians of protection and healing. In their mythology, it was divided into six parts, which represented each of the six senses, as Steve says. And interestingly, each part is also associated with a specific fraction, like a number fraction, which was then used as a system of measurement for ingredients for things like medicine, which I thought was a quite an interesting little fact that I hadn't come across before. The one thing that the show does get wrong is that you can see pretty clearly when Steve is talking about the different senses, he talks about the eyebrow representing thought, which is true, and then the eye is sight, pretty self-explanatory, but then he points to the inner corner of the eye and says it represents hearing, which is actually not true. The inner corner of the eye represented smell because it's closest to the nose, and the outer corner of the eye represented hearing because it's closest to the ear. So that was like the one bit that I was like, oh, caught you in a wee mistake there. I I'm not sure exactly why they had him point to one and not the other, but maybe they just didn't have any anybody on the show to really fact check or do continuity on that kind of stuff. It's a very, very minor nitpick though, but I did catch that one mistake. The next bit of like exposition dump that we get is about the Heka priests, which are in like kind of a next room and they have a mural and there's a table with blood on it and then canopic jars all around. So I thought, Steve's line of what the heck is a heka to be quite funny, but I also found it to be kind of a bit weird because as someone who's supposed to be an ancient Egypt nerd who knows all of these other things and can read hieroglyphs apparently, Steve doesn't know what a heka priest is. That was kind of a moment where I was like, what? The god Heka is the deification of magic and medicine. Unlike other gods, he didn't really have like a formal cult of worship with priests and everything, Rather, people like doctors and healers would be called priests of Heka, but they weren't necessarily considered to be sorcerers as they're talked about in the show. There's reference to the fact that these priests are buried with the Pharaoh to protect him in the afterlife, which is a twisting <laughs> of things. This practice is often referred to as retainer sacrifice, where you bury somebody with an important individual to provide a service to them in the afterlife. And it's not something that we only see happening in ancient Egypt. It happened in several various ancient cultures. In ancient Egyptian contexts, however, it is something that was very much limited to the first dynasty of Egypt, which predates the pyramids. Uh, so it's around the period of 3100 to 2900 BCE. And it was not something that they practiced for a very long time. It kind of like died out of use after the first dynasty. The occupant of this tomb that we're in, as we find out slightly later in the episode, actually lived about 2,500 years after this practice died out in ancient Egypt. And generally the people being sacrificed weren't priests by nature. So this is definitely a bit of like a twisting and in some ways actually a callback to my favorite ancient Egyptian movie of all time, 1999's The Mummy. So I wonder if this is maybe like a bit of a reference to that. Probably not, but that's how it's gonna live on in my head. Another thing that I noticed was that obviously the during the scene, a person gets put on this table and then the, the Hakka priest takes a knife, which actually looked quite accurate for a mummification knife if you look up references 
of them on Google and presumably carves out the innards heart or something of someone for whatever purpose. As I said, the priests of Hekka were more doctors and healers, which would have been a very separate profession from the priests of Anubis slash Impu, who would have been in charge of embalming and mummifying the dead. So there was definitely a mixing of several different parts of mythology going on here to create what the narrative of a bit of an element of horror. So I think this episode was actually probably quite heavily inspired by the mummy horror films, which is very interesting to think about. And I'd be really interested to know if that is the case. Ushabtis, as they talk about, are these little figurines, but their function was not to imprison someone. It was rather to help people in the afterlife. They were a specific type of grave good that were meant to come alive in the afterlife to help the deceased as servants and laborers on their journey through the underworld to be weighed on the scales against the feather of Maat. Hands down one of my favorite scenes in the entire series is the one where Stephen comes across the final burial chamber in this tomb of Amit's last avatar. I smiled so much when I watched it and I definitely could see myself having that kind of a moment if I were ever in that kind of a position to discover something like that. I think that they got the overall layout of the tomb pretty spot on with like the low ceilings, the heavy columns, they actually showed some Ushabtis uh, with the shields and the spears on the floor and then it is revealed that the last of Ahmed's avatars was the very famous Alexander the Great. Right before we get into a little bit more about Alexander, I just want to quickly reference the dialogue that Steve has where he talks about, oh, this is going to be one of the big ones. It's going to be like Tutmos II or Nefertiti, which I thought was a really interesting inclusion of those two particular royal burials. Tutmos II, fairly confident that we've discovered his mummy in what the very famous Deir al-Bahri cache, which are a bunch of royal mummies that were removed from their tombs because their tombs were being looted and then rewrapped and buried elsewhere to help preserve them. So anyway, we're pretty sure we found his mummy, but we have not definitively found whatever tomb he was either taken from or intended to be interred with. And he himself is not what I would consider to be one of the big ones. He is a semi-famous pharaoh, but he's famous for the fact that he was husband of King Hatshepsut, the most famous woman to rule Egypt. Other than the fact that he was her husband, there's not really much notable about him. The other person mentioned here is Nefertiti. I'm hoping most of you probably know who that is when I say that. She is much more of a mystery. Unlike Tutmos II, we don't have her mummy and we don't know where her actual tomb was. There are two tombs that were either intended for her or parts of a tomb that were intended for her uh, at the site of Amarna, also known as Akhetaten, where her husband built these tombs. Suffice to say, the end of her life is still a pretty big question mark. We don't know exactly when she died, what she died of, and she is again, probably one of the most famous women of ancient Egypt. So yeah, to find her tomb and her mummy in it would be pretty flippin' exciting. <laughs> Back to Alexander the Great. The reason why Steve knows that this is Alexander the Great's tomb is because he sees Macedonian writing, I think, on the end of the sarcophagus. Now, this is something I don't really know how I feel about because there is a bit of debate around this, but Alexander himself probably would have been brought up speaking ancient Macedonian, which is different than the language that is spoken there today. But his entire formal education and probably the majority of his life would have been spent speaking Attic Greek because this was the language spoken by the rest of the Greek states. And Alexander and his father, Philip, were very big on the Hellenization of themselves and Macedon, so being seen as Greek. On top of that, Alexander himself was also very much entranced, I maybe is the correct word, I don't really know, with ancient Egypt. So when he conquered Egypt, he spent a lot of time there, he got very involved with their religion and their religious rituals, and it definitely was probably one of the favorite places that he conquered. If we were to find Alexander the Great's tomb, it would be written in either Attic Greek, 
or ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. It wouldn't be written necessarily in ancient Macedonian because that is a really niche language that not the majority of people would have been able to speak at that time. I'll also say that using him as the last avatar of Amit, I'd be interested to know if they're ever going to delve more into why he was chosen because yes, he is one of the world's most famous conquerors and he did create one of the largest empires on earth. But you know, from what I've read about Alexander and justice and being someone who had a real emphasis on bringing justice to people, not something I necessarily associate with him with. So yeah, the connection there is kind of one that I question a little bit. When Steve opens the sarcophagus, how that lid didn't fall off because it would have been probably solid, intended to look like it was solid gold. I have no idea. They don't turn on a hinge like that. I highly doubt he would have been able to push that off by himself. But anyway, I will say that the wrap job that they did on that mummy was chef's kiss. It was beautiful. Hey guys, editing Rachel here. I would do this in a video format, but since filming, I have caught a cold and I look and kind of feel like death. So I figured I would just do a quick voice note here. In the frenzy of filming this, I forgot to add in that as a professional archaeologist, I want to say that I was cringing slash horrified at the entire sequence where Mark slash Steve opens Alexander's sarcophagus and desecrates his mummy uh, looking for Amit's Ushabti. Definitely if you find something like that, don't do that. Not only is it disrespectful to the, the person that you are uh, looking for, uh, it is against many laws and nowadays we have nice fancy CT machines and x-rays that can look for a lot of this stuff back in a safe lab environment where everything can be climate controlled, where we can examine the occupant uh, as safely as possible for both the preservation of their remains and for our own health and safety. I really hope that he washed his hands after sticking them down a dead man's throat. Interesting thing about the body of Alexander, when he died, it went on a funeral procession and I think it was going back to Greece and Macedon to be buried there. On the way, his general Ptolemy stole the body and took it to Egypt. It was actually then, it was then stored in a, I guess like a tomb in a way where people could publicly visit and look at it. So there are records of people like Julius Caesar and Augustus, the first Roman emperor, visiting the body of Alexander the Great 300 years after he died. After the year 200 CE, it's a bit unclear about what happened to it. At some point he did have a gold coffin, but this was replaced by a descendant of Ptolemy because he wanted to use the coffin to melt it down for money. So he replaced it with like a clear crystal glass coffin that you could just kind of like see through. His tomb and his mummy are, are currently lost to history. We do not know where they are. We do not know if his mummy survives. It seems to me like it's probably quite unlikely, but there are ongoing projects in Alexandria, which is where the body was stored, to try and find at least the tomb, even if there's nothing inside of it. Moving on, in the mental asylum, we meet Tawara, who is the goddess of childbirth and fertility, but also for, serves a secondary function of cleansing and purifying the death on their journey to the underworld. So her inclusion here does kind of make sense, but not as much sense as it would for some other gods. But it's pretty clear here for anybody who's familiar with ancient Egyptian gods that she's subbing in for Inpu slash Anubis, who I presume is probably imprisoned in an Ushabti, which is why he's not here. And I would be interested to learn why and if he's going to get freed at a later point to maybe cause a little more chaos but yeah she's not this is not her traditional role but i think that's pretty clear in the show we then find steve and mark in the juat which is technically the region through which Ra travels during the night from west to east in order to have the sun rise again the next day and it is also the place that people's souls went to after death on their way to be judged to enter their version of heaven in the afterlife in the field of reed. The geography of G the Juat is very different than what you see in the show. It is not a sea of sand that you travel on by a boat. It more closely resembles just basically the same geography and world that the ancient Egyptians inhabited, but in addition to having rivers, lakes, 
sand, islands, etc. It also had lakes of fire, walls of iron, and trees of turquoise. On your journey through the Juwa, you would come across gates, mounds, and caverns that would be guarded by supernatural creatures, and you would have to pass their challenges and tests in order to proceed on to the next gate. It's unclear what happened if you didn't make it through a gate. I don't, I don't know if they ever really show that in ancient Egypt, but I did see one reference that people who failed would get thrown into like a lake of fire to suffer for eternity. So suffice to say it probably wasn't a very pleasant outcome. The very famous Book of the Dead, or Book of the Dead Cow as it's actually called, was actually a spellbook cheat sheet written for the dead to help them bypass and make their way past all of these gates. And at the end of the journey they would then come upon like a court of the gods where their heart would be weighed on the scales of justice against the feather of Ma'at, who is the goddess that represents truth. And I did catch in the show that the feather does seem to be an ostrich feather, which was what it was represented as in ancient Egypt. So that was a nice little tidbit that I spotted. Obviously the show doesn't get nearly that complex and instead represents a series of trials and challenges for Mark and Steve to kind of try and face who they really are, which I think is supposed to be kind of like similar to the journey people have to go through in the underlife, but obviously it's not quite the same. The last thing I'm going to cover here is Layla, particularly her costume. I will also say that I loved her character. I loved that she was Egyptian. I read a thing about her insistence on having her curly Egyptian hair and the reasons behind that, which I thought was a great thing to add into that. I also really liked that as a character, she was very independent. She did not rely on Mark to save her. Oftentimes she was saving him. The part where she becomes Tuarat's temporary avatar, don't know how that's gonna turn out in season two, which we hopefully get, I think is quite interesting. Her costume bugged me slightly in that she is shown to have these wings, these metal wings that she can use for protection and flying and, and whatnot. These types of wings are Again, a very famous depiction that you see on several goddesses in ancient Egyptian mythology, but as far as I'm aware, they've never been associated with Tawada, the hippo goddess. To be fair to the costume designers, I think it would be kind of hard to represent a hippo in a costume of a female character, so I can understand why they went with the wings instead, but I think that if you were going to do that, it would make more sense if the goddess that she was the avatar for was either Isis or Ma'at, I, I'm sure that the people making this show have reasons that I'm not privy to for making Tawada her goddess rather than someone else, and it probably harks back to the comics, which I have not read. Okay guys, that's everything for today. There's probably a few things that I missed here or things that I could have gone into a bit more detail on, but I haven't had time for a really true deep dive, and I'm not a professional Egyptologist. If you guys are interested, I could see if I could get some of my friends who are Egyptologists to watch and talk about, and then we could talk about the show maybe a little bit more on the channel. Let me know if that's the kind of video that you would be interested in. Did you notice anything that I missed? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video, don't forget to give me a thumbs up, subscribe to help support the channel and to see more videos from me, and if you have time, go over to Instagram and please give me a follow there, at rachelalman.digs. Thanks everybody for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!